In 1987, the original RoboCop was released and has become a cult phenomenon ever since. It tells the story of Detroit cop Alex Murphy, played by Peter Weller, who gets brutally gunned down by vicious criminal Clarence J. Bodica. To which Murphy gets brought back to life and converted into RoboCop, super-powered, cybernetic, half-man, half-robot, all-cop hybrid, who is here to clean up the crime that plagues Detroit. However, memories start to surface of his life and murder as Murphy, which plague RoboCop as he suffers traumatic flashbacks of his demise, to which RoboCop becomes hell-bent to take revenge on those who killed him when he was human. Where it turns out that Detroit's most violent gang is in fact working for Dick Jones, the senior vice president of powerful company OCP, which owns the police and of course RoboCop, in which Murphy must fight to no longer just be a product, but also reclaim his humanity in this brilliant, action-packed satire. So unless your Prime Directives haven't filled you in already, today we are looking into the bad arsery that is Robocop, as we explore 10 things that you may not know about this sci-fi classic. So let's roll the credits while I comically insert the obligatory clip of the old buy that for a dollar guy as we check it out. I'd buy that for a dollar. Better alive, you are coming with me. Number 10. Robocop started on the set of Blade Runner. Robocop's co-writer, Edward Neumeyer, was working on the set of Blade Runner in an unofficial capacity in 1982. He was aspiring to be a scriptwriter and joined the Blade Runner production to learn more about the filmmaking process. He was interested in the script of Blade Runner in that it was about a cop tracking down robots, or in this case, replicants, where he got the idea of writing a story that was something of a reversal, about a cop who was a robot who was hunting down human criminals. Newmeyer met up with Robocop's other scriptwriter, Michael Miner, after observing a robotic-themed music video which he had directed. And so, over the next couple of months, they would both collaborate and write the script of Robocop. Number 9. Other Inspirations for Robocop Newmeyer and Miner both took inspirations from other pop culture foundations to create Robocop, particularly with comic books. Judge Dredd in particular is considered a huge inspiration when it comes to Robocop due to the many similarities between the two characters. Robocop even says some of the catchphrases that Judge Dredd has also spoken, like Come quietly or there will be trouble. Even early designs of Robocop look very similar to Judge Dredd, like, as in pretty identical. The Marvel comic Rom is also said to be an inspiration to Robocop, who like Robocop starts off as a normal organic man, but is transformed into a cyborg warrior. In fact, in several scenes in Robocop, you can actually see some Rom comics, such as in the convenience store and at Murphy's home during the flashback sequence. Inspiration was also taken from the classic Alfred Hitchcock movie Psycho, which sees the main protagonist killed in the movie's first act, similar to what happened to the Murphy character. The writers also took inspiration to real-world issues, such as the big, powerful corporate business culture of the 80s, which is where the OCP corporation element comes from. And the two writers decided to set Robocop in Detroit, due to the decline of the motor industry that was taking place at that time. So, really, Robocop was an amalgamation of Blade Runner, comic books, and 1980s corporate economics. Number 8. The first director left Robocop. So the script to Robocop was doing the rounds with New Meyer and Miner trying to entice buyers. The script would eventually get sold to Orion Pictures, who a few years earlier also distributed the other big cyborg movie of the 80s, The Terminator. Director Jonathan Kaplan came on board as director, but while script rewrites were taking place, he lost interest and left the project to direct Project X instead. 
other directors were approached to direct Robocop, including Repo Man director Alex Cox and David Cronenberg, whom had just recently had success with The Fly. Co-writer Michael Miner himself stood up to the challenge and tried to negotiate for himself to direct Robocop, but Orion didn't want to put such a big production in the hands of someone who hadn't had much experience in the industry. It actually took six months to find the right director for Robocop, and even when they found the right guy, it was still a struggle. Number 7. Paul Verhoeven originally turned down Robocop an executive at Orion Pictures suggested that Dutch director Paul Verhoeven could direct Robocop. Verhoeven at that stage mainly directed Dutch movies, but caught everyone's attention with his 1985 English-speaking movie Flesh and Blood. Verhoeven was sent a copy of the Robocop script, and after reading the first page, called it a piece of shit and threw it in the bin. Verhoeven was then sent another copy, and was asked to really read the subtext of the script, but he still wasn't interested. And it was Verhoeven's wife who then picked up the script and read it and told her husband that it is a good script and it features themes that would resonate with him, like a character losing their identity. Verhoeven then took the job as director and it is said that he added a Jesus Christ metaphor to the movie in that Murphy is killed and resurrected. And many fans have noticed in a showdown between Murphy and Bodica in the movie's climax, it's kind of filmed in a way which looks like Murphy is walking on water. Yeah, Robo-Jesus. So, really, we have Paul Verhoeven's wife to thank for Robocop. Thank you for your cooperation. Number 6. Finding the Right Robocop So when it came to the pivotal role of Alex Murphy and Robocop, Orion's number one choice was Arnold Schwarzenegger, thanks to his previous success with The Terminator, which, as mentioned, was also produced by Orion Pictures. But it was felt that his build was too big and solid to cover him up in a robotic costume, which would make him look more like the Michelin Man. Other actors considered include Michael Ironside, Rutger Hauer, Tom Berenger, and James Remar. But many of the actors considered weren't too enthusiastic with the idea that their faces would be covered up throughout most of the film. The legendary Peter Weller was chosen because of his prior role in the adventures of Buckaroo Banzai across the Ape Dimension and also because of his slim build, which would help with wearing his robotic armor without making it look too big or puffy. At the time, Weller was actually scheduled to have a role in King Kong Lives, but chose to star in Robocop instead. Good call. They really hit gold with Weller, as he's perfect in the role. He brings a lot of heart and sincerity to the part. In the scenes where he's Robocop, thanks to his movements and mannerisms, you generally believe the guy is robotic, and it's heartbreaking later in the movie where we see him fight to reclaim his humanity. Bottom line is, Robocop could have been a very silly role, but Weller makes it not only believable, but heartbreaking and tragic too, adding that much needed human element. Number 5. Other Casting Procedures When it came to Robocop's friend, Officer Lewis, actress Stephanie Zimbalist was cast in the role, but she was forced to drop out when the TV show that she was starring in at the time, Remington Still, suddenly had a new season greenlit, so she was contracted to star in that. So, no Robocop for her. The interesting thing is also at that time, Pierce Brosnan was cast as James Bond, but he was also forced to drop out of the role and return to Remington Still. Man, Remington Still just ruined everyone's day back then. It seemed that with the cast, Paul Verhoeven wanted to subvert expectations, as Nancy Allen was subsequently cast as Lewis, and she was seen as a lady heartthrob back in the 70s and 80s, thanks to her long strawberry blonde hair, in which Verhoeven had her cut it all off, and encouraged her to act tough and macho in the role, in order to deliberately go against this public image, and it works. She plays a pretty tough bare knuckles cop, who you wouldn't want to get on the wrong side with. Likewise, Ronnie Cox was cast as the movie's sinister big bad Dick Jones on the grounds of his public persona. Thanks to his movie roles, he was seen as someone who was gentle, kind, and mild-mannered. So it was for this reason that Verhoeven cast him as the truly evil and corrupt and feared Jones. Cox would even say that playing the villain was a gazillion times more fun than playing the good guys. 
Then of course you got Kurtwood Smith who played the truly nasty piece of work Clarence Boddicker. Originally Smith auditioned for the role of Dick Jones before landing Boddicker, where despite his small stature was truly terrifying as the street thug, as you know that this is a guy with no morals or empathy and would have no problems killing you if it would somehow benefit him. Then of course you got Miguel Ferrer who played Bob Morton. Now this is an interesting character as he's basically Robocop's father as he's the guy who created him and thus brought Murphy back to life. But he is essentially a terrible person who invented Robocop not out of goodwill but for his own gain at the OCP Corporation. I never really know what exactly to make of his character and when he dies am I meant to feel bad for him or am I meant to be cheering for his demise? I honestly don't know what to take from this character but that's not necessarily a complaint either. But I know what you're all thinking. I've left out one of the most important characters. Yes, that's right. The I'll buy that for a dollar guy. I'd buy that for a dollar. Well, the character is called Bixby Snyder and his fictional comedy show in Robocop was called Not My Problem. The part was played by S.D. Nemeth, who was a writer and actor and also appeared in a schlock movie called The Lobster Man from Mars. You know, just throwing it out there. Number 4, Issues with the Title Although we all know the title Robocop and what it means and embrace it as the movie's title, back when Robocop was in production, many of the cast and crew didn't like the title as they thought it sounded stupid. Now once again you have to remember this was a time before Robocop was a thing. The LA Times flat out called it a terrible title for a movie and even the marketing division of Orion Pictures thought the title was a liability as they thought it sounded too similar to GoBots and Ronnie the Robot. But despite many finding the name silly, Robocop still stuck. And it's hard to imagine it being named anything else. Originally, the title was Robocop, the Future of Law Enforcement, before being cut down to just simply Robocop. Michael Miner claimed that at one stage in the writing process, he came up with the name Supercop. And in the movie, a fellow police officer even refers to Robocop as Supercop. It's Supercop! Talking of changes in the script, there were some changes and proposed changes that were being made to the story during the writing process. At one stage, Orion wanted to change the location and for the story to not be set in Detroit, but Newmeyer and Meyer stood their ground and insisted that the action takes place in Detroit. Originally, there was no connection between the villains Bodica and Dick Jones, and that they were just two separate villains with their own motivations. But making the two foes accomplices ties the story together nicely, making the story one big scheme. At one stage in the script, there was even going to be a romance subplot between Robocop and Lewis, something that I'm really glad that they scrapped, as that would have been a very Hollywood thing to do. And part of Robocop's appeal is that it breaks conventions. And look, I don't know, it just wouldn't have felt right. Number three, makeup and effects. The special effects of the movie were led by movie effects wizard Rob Botton, who also worked on the effects of John Carpenter's The Thing and Total Recall. And they are gruesomely delightful and gave the movie an edge, along with giving the movie issues with its ratings classification, as they may have been a little too brutal for its time. When designing Robocop's suit, Botin took inspiration from Metropolis and The Day the Earth Stood Still. The costume was mainly made out of fiberglass and flexible foam latex and took six months to construct. The suit looks amazing and timeless, even by today's standards, and just has a slick coolness about it. Although sometimes wearing the costume could be a bit too much for Peter Weller, as it really restricted his movements. And supposedly in some scenes where you just see Robo's upper torso, like when he's driving and walking around in the nightclub, well, apparently he was only wearing the upper part of his costume and underneath was just wearing his underpants. A standout moment in makeup effects was the melting of the Emil character, played by Paul McCrane. The effect still looks as gruesome and as shocking as it did back then, and that effect alone caused issues for Robocop's rating, but thankfully it was left in. The ED-209 effect was created by using a life-size model along with stop motion. Stop motion is very much a dying art nowadays thanks to CGI, but it looks great in Robocop and makes you miss practical effects used in movies. 
The only effect to me that doesn't look good in the movie and sticks out like a sore thumb is the death of Dick Jones, where after being shot by Robocop and falling out of the OCP office, we see that his arms have suddenly grown in length, which sadly makes it look kind of comical. It reminds me of that scene in A Nightmare on Elm Street where Freddy Krueger suddenly had long arms. It just looks weird and doesn't work. But to be fair, there was a time limit in creating this effect, in which the Dick Jones puppet was made out of foam rubber with an aluminium skeleton. Sadly, due to the time restraint, a more articulate, better quality puppet couldn't be made. Which is why we get this shot of Dick Jones and his unusually long arms. <laughs> but it's only a split second, so I can live with it. But either way, Dick Jones and his unusually long arms of the law were no match for Robocop. Number two, marketing to kids. Indeed, believe it or not, but Robocop, a violent R-rated movie, actually got merchandise aimed at children, including action figures and a video game. But the most curious tie-in to coincide with Robocop was actually an animated series. The Robocop series only lasted for one season, consisting of 12 episodes, and it was co-produced by Marvel Productions, and it was broadcast in 1988. The cartoon's intro even starts off with a sort of recap of the movie, where we literally see Murphy gunned down, and look, Clarence Boddicker even makes an appearance. Obviously, the show was toned down for a child-friendly audience, and thus it couldn't be too violent, where instead of using guns with bullets, ones that shoot lasers are shown instead. So yeah, kids, enjoy your Saturday morning Cocoa Pops as you watch this cartoon about a police officer who was brutally murdered and horrifically brought back to life as a human-robot hybrid. But to be fair, though, the animation in the show was actually pretty good. But it didn't catch on, and the series has slipped into obscurity. And while we're talking about kids' cartoons and toys, let's not forget about the bootleg action figure, Robot Cop. Yes, part man! Part machine, all Robert. Bonus entry, Robocop's connection to fried chicken. Yeah, as odd as it sounds, but in some parts of the world, Robocop seems to be a popular mascot to help sell fried chicken. I personally can't see the connection between Robocop and fried chicken, but heck, what do I know? I'm not in marketing. First up, we have this South Korean advert, where a mother is cooking some fried chicken, which is so awesome, it makes Robocop leave the confines of the TV world and enter the real world, just to get his hands on some fried chicken. Yeah, to hell with that baby food Robocop was eating, now he wants some fried chicken. In fact, Robocop is so determined to get some fried chicken, he even steals this poor family's refrigerator. Yeah, serve and protect my ass. Oddly, the advert even uses the cowboy theme music from Back to the Future Part 3. <sighs> Once again, what's the connection? Then Robocop was seen in a series of KFC adverts, where we get Colonel Robocop, who is a hybrid of Colonel Sanders and Robocop. <laughs> Look, I swear you couldn't make this stuff up. <laughs> yes, part man. Heart machine, all secret recipe. But as odd as this is, it's actually kind of awesome. I really want to see a Colonel Robocop movie where he defeats baddies with fried chicken. <laughs> Number one, a legend in the making. Shortly before Robocop's release, there was an issue with the MPAA, as Robocop's production was hoping to get an R rating, but it was incidentally slapped with an X. So certain cuts and trims had to be made to some of the excessive scenes, many of which would return for the movie's DVD release. Robocop was released in July 1987, and really did exceed expectations, with the movie going on to make over $53 million on a $13 million budget as well as becoming the fourth highest grossing movie of that year. Robocop was actually praised by both critics and audiences alike, who appreciated its action, science fiction elements, as well as its use of violent satire and comedy, and has gone on to become one of the greatest science fiction movies of all time. I can vividly remember my first encounter with Robocop. I was eight years old and it was advertised on TV that Robocop will be broadcast at midnight, 
completely uncut. So without anyone knowing, I snuck out of bed and got a VHS tape and recorded it. The next morning I got up bright and early before anyone else was awake and watched it. And I was honestly blown away by the movie. I had never seen anything so brutal and violent. But it was okay as to me it felt more comic book than it did realistic. And I loved it. And it also kind of felt like a rite of passage. That I was leaving the safe confines of children's movies like The Wizard of Oz and Disney movies and entering this new domain where not everything you see is safe and that movies can show violent, brutal worlds. Robocop was my introduction to entering that next level of movie appreciation. The world of R-rated movies. And so I've been hooked on Robocop ever since. But behind the razzle and dazzle of the special effects, action and satire of corporate consumerism, there is a very human heartfelt story that lies in Robocop about a man being brought back to life as a product who has to fight in order to find his humanity again. Nice shooting son, what's your name? Murphy. I guess it goes without saying that Robocop is a masterpiece. All fans of the action sci-fi genre should definitely check out the original movie. It's nothing short of superb. Anyway, I'm Minty, and to all those watching, your prime directives is to click a thumbs up on this video. See ya!